Um, okay. So, welcome everyone to the second in the series of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion events hosted by the Birmingham Business School. In this session, we'll look at the experiences of LGBTQ plus alumni and students in the world of work, the perceived challenges they may have faced and how we practice authenticity in the workplace, as well as encouraging allyship amongst our colleagues. Just to note that the language used in this web webinar, including terms like LGBTQ+, and queer, are non-exhaustive of all sexual and gender identities, and may be interchanged with different terms which will be reflective of the pan panelist's personal experience, but are always intended to be inclusive. Please be aware of a person's pronouns when asking questions, and please use they, them as a default if they haven't made their pronouns clear. Please be respectful. The experiences of the, pa the panelists uh, we'll talk about may be sensitive, so it's really important that everyone feels comfortable to share. The chat function has been turned off, so please use the Q&A function to ask questions or make comments. The event is being recorded and sent to, uh, will be sent to attendees after the event. Any questions you are asked will be anonymous. So now I've got that long spiel out of the way, I'm going to uh, introduce our wonderful chair and pass the mic over. So Lowry Evans is, the P is a PhD student at the University of Birmingham. Lowry's research focuses on the perform performance of heteronormative gender roles and LGBTQ plus ally, uh, identity along, alongside the use of parenting policy in the UK. As part of her work in, as a research assistant for the Equal Parenting Project at the University of Birmingham, Lowry has worked on government and higher education research projects, such as the development of the Fathers in Workplace tool Toolkit which was launched in the House of Commons in March 2019. So Lowry, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm going to pass on to you and minimise my <laughs> large <face. laughs> Uh, well, thank you, Rose, for, for the introduction. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce our panellists today. We've got um, some Birmingham alumni and students on the panel today. I'm going to briefly introduce them and give you an opportunity to start submitting some um, questions into the Q&A box. And then I'll just ask them all to introduce themselves and tell you a bit more before we get the questions started. So starting with Matt Cameron, who is Global Managing Director at LGBT great. He studied for a degree in modern and medieval history with Italian at the University of Birmingham and now is managing director for LGBT great, which is a global membership program, which is a specialist in developing LGBT plus diversity and inclusion within the investment and savings industry. And his role within that organization, he's responsible for the organization's strategic direction and his vision for the investments and saving industry is to achieve LGBT plus equality and inclusion within that sector. We've also got Suki Sandhu on the panel today, who's founder and CEO of Involve, which is a network championing um, diversity and inclusion in businesses. Uh, Involve helps organizations drive cultural change and helps to create more inclusive workplaces through the use of events, programs, leadership and inclusion solutions. Suki was awarded an OBE for services to diversity in business in 2019 and in 2011 established Orderless, which is a global boutique executive search firm, which has leveled the playing field for women, ethnic minorities and LGBTQ plus people within senior levels in business. And then finally, we have Saoirse Hughes on our panel, They're an LGBTQ plus students officer at the University of Birmingham, and Saoirse sits on the committee for the LGBTQ plus association, which influences the university policies and runs campaigns on issues affecting queer communities at the university. They're also currently working on the Not On campaign, which is tackling sexual harassment and assault, which involves running interactive workshops across these themes, as well as on consent. So I'm just going to briefly pass on to the panel and we'll start with Matt. If Matt, maybe you could introduce yourself and just tell us a bit more about yourself. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Larry. And um, good afternoon, everyone, to sort of dining in today. Um, so, yeah, just to build a little bit of what um, sort of Larry was explaining a, a bit about my sort of background. Um, so I left Birmingham University back in 2009, so quite sort of some time ago uh, now. But before that, I was from uh, a place called Lancashire, uh, a place called Blackpool, which uh, some of you may have uh, heard of before. 
Um, so very much an first in the family to go to, go to university. Um, my pronouns are he and him. Um, I uh, am a gay man. Um, been working in, in London since I left university and actually started my career in sort of recruitment consultancy uh, and a little bit like Suki moving into, into the search side. Uh, and really over the last sort of five and a half years, I've, I've really sort of been specialising in developing more uh, sort of LGBT diversity inclusive workplaces specifically within a subsection of the financial services industry. So I spend a lot of time now sort of advising uh, sort of executives and boards around LGBT issues. Um, and there's a number of sort of campaigns, projects and initiatives that we run um, sort of throughout the year. Um, so really excited to be uh, joining today. Uh, and all I've got to say is that obviously all the best people so if you go to Birmingham. So yeah. <laughs> Fab, thank you, Matt. And Suki, if you could tell us a bit more about um, yourself and what you, work you do for the LGBTQ plus community. Yeah, sure. It's it's Lowry, isn't it? Is it Lowry? Lowry. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Lowry. Um, I mean, you, to be fair, you did a really good introduction. Um, I, so yeah, I'm Suki. Nice to nice to meet you all. Also, very proud to be a um, a graduate of University of Birmingham. I'm a lot older than Matt. I graduated in 2002, which practically makes me ancient in the LGBTQ community. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, I studied economics at university, um, and yeah, so I very much I've been I've been in the world of search for um, pretty much eighteen years, like my entire career. Although I, I did probably more junior hiring at the beginning, um, and I launched Ordell. It's our tenth anniversary actually in April, so it's been it would have been ten years, and we are effectively changing the face of boardrooms and leadership teams globally. So we have an office in London, one in New York. Everyone is working globally. I have about 40 employees across both businesses globally. And um, yeah, we have an incredible track record of doing diverse appointments, including trying to get chairman and CEOs to think more broadly than say gender, race, getting them to consider LGBT plus. And then Involve, it's a global inclusion consulting firm that works with a lot of major brands and companies to help them be more inclusive. And we really work in an intersectional way. So for us, it's working across like LGBT plus, um, race and gender, because we're very conscious that intersectionality is the future and to really drive the change we need, we need the allies for the different communities to also work together. So um, that's, it kind of involved, kind of started as an LGBT kind of membership organization and good luck to Matt doing a membership organization. I will never be doing it again. And it's evolved into a consulting firm, which is more advisory. So. We, we publish these wrong model lists of the top 100 women, top 100 ethnic minorities, top 100 LGBT plus. Um, we were the first ones that focused on a list that focused on business leaders globally. So in 2013, we did like a top 50 LGBT plus leaders globally published in the Financial Times. And it was pretty, it was the first because it's the first like LGBT list. And it was obviously encouraging more leaders to come out because at the time, there was only one ape in the LGBT CEO in the FTSE 100, which was Christopher Bailey at Burberry. And actually we've gone backwards because there aren't any right now in the FTSE 100, hence why we do need to have a laser focus on LGBT inclusion without forgetting about the intersections of LGBT plus as well. Because what we don't want is it for it to be focused primarily, which it has in the past on gay white men. We want to make sure that it's inclusive of all types of LGBT plus people. That was a very long monologue. <laughs> give you an idea of what it is. And yeah. obviously, very proud to have the Queen here. She, it's a it's a life size cardboard cutout given to me by a candidate about nine years ago, which I've held on to, and I adore adore her. And as you heard, she gave me an ABE in 2019. So she's like my guardian angel here behind me. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Well, thank you, Suki. And then Sorsha, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and telling us a bit about yourself and the work that you're doing at the moment. Yeah, of course. Hello, everybody. It's nice to um, be here. I'm really glad to be here today. Um, yeah, so I am a final year international relations student. Um, so yet to graduate, fingers crossed. Um, and I am also the LGBTQ plus students officer. So that's a part time position um, in the Guild of Students. So I do alongside my studies. Um, and yeah, it's really been a, a chance for me to kind of cultivate my passions, um, particularly education is something that I'm really passionate about. Um, I've also, as um, Lori mentioned, um, worked for the Not On campaign. So we run intersectional and um, interactive workshops on consent, harassment um, and all of those areas. But recently I've been kind of putting those two projects together and um, cultivating kind of um, LGBTQ plus healthy relationships workshops, um, also with a bit of an allyship um, 
angle as well, you know, just kind of being able to discuss LGBTQ plus issues and the nuances that exist within LGBTQ plus communities, as Suki kind of alluded to there, you know, there are definitely issues of inequality and oppression within the community as well. Um, I think that the only way to, you know, overcome that is by having open conversations and non-judgmental spaces where people can ask their questions and learn. Um, and so, yeah, as I've said, intersectionality has been a really big push for me personally this year. Um, Black History Month was, you know, a great opportunity to do intersectional events with ethnic minority students, disabled students, um, even students within Pulsus, Pulsus in Colour. Um, so, you know, I've been, it's been a great opportunity for me to um, really develop my passions and hopefully start my, my, me on the long career that um, I would like to have in the future um, in these sort of areas. So, yeah, that's pretty much me. Well, you might need to call me up. Of course, there, <laughs> yes. Yeah, there could be a job in involved for you. Well, I definitely will. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thank you to all our panelists. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start uh, um, asking the first question, and while we wait for some questions to come into the Q and A, so I'll start with Matt and Suki. To what extent do you think that stereotypical perceptions of LGBT plus community members exist? And what do you think organisations should be doing or what is your organisation doing to solve this? Who would you like first? <laughs> and we can start with you, Matt. <laughs> Okay, do. Yeah, so I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm speaking on, on behalf of um, the industry that I represent, as opposed to also own sort of individual firms. So if you think about sort of financial services as sort of the umbrella, sort of lots of different types of organisations within that sort of sector. Um, so we have sort of banking, investment banking, retail banking, you know, corporate finance, etc. Where we sort of specialise actually within a real niche area called investment wealth management and savings industry. So typically, these are the organisations that are managing funds on behalf of both businesses. Um, and individuals. So examples of clients that we work with would be BlackRock, Schroders, Legal in General, um, that manage across sort of institutional retail pensions of investments. Um, I guess in the industry that I represent, um, one of the reasons actually we launched LGBT Great uh, sort, of, sort, of, sort of two years ago, because what I sort of recognised was that there had been a lot of a lot more progress and a lot more visibility, um, although there's, there's still a lot more to do. Um, in other industry sectors, and actually even in comparison to other subsectors within the industry. Um, and we, we still have a very sort of traditionalist uh, culture. We know that sort of diversity and representation is, is significantly lower uh, than what it is within other sectors. Um, only around sort of 4% of investing decisions in the UK at the moment are currently made by women. And um, we know there's also a lot less LGBT people in the sector as well in comparison to to other areas of financial services too. So I guess one of the things, the first thing that we did really was to work with executive leadership to really try and understand, you know, what are the barriers and why haven't we, you know, made the same progress uh, as what other industry sectors had? Why is it that within the Stonewall Top 100, there is no representation of the industry that, that we represent, yet it's part of the financial services industry that is, you know, the engine room of the global economy, uh, you know, really significant sector actually for businesses and governments and, and sort of individuals. So the first thing that we, we did was have that have that sort of tough conversation and, and you know ask some interesting sort of questions and really what we got to is that actually you know don't sort of judge a book by its colour just because it perhaps looks like you know something else and we obviously have those stereotypes about what we think when we think about financial services and investment which is typically um, white uh, heterosexual and, and more often than not privately educated men it actually doesn't mean that the support doesn't exist actually just needs encouraging uh, and making uh, making visible. So one of the, the first things that we sort of did was to, to launch a sort of a, an industry specific role modeling campaign that was aimed at really developing both LGBT plus visibility um, but also the, uh, the visibility of allies too. And when we did it, it was quite a, you know, quite a bold move. We launched it with the, the hashtag here I am campaign, um, which essentially went viral within the industry and, and really sort of got picked up and really encouraged support from a whole range of different people within the industry globally. So lots of people from Asia were having people sort of reach out to us from uh, parts of Africa, um, you know, America. So it was, it was really great to see that level of support. So I think the first thing that organisations need to do is to make a very deliberate and, you know, visible uh, statement of support uh, and know actually how to layer that in them with, you know, different interventions um, moving forward. I think that the second thing that we really tried to think about was how can we 
really resonate actually with the industry as well. Um, and again, through the sort of the process of the R&D that we did, it was around how do we measure and track progress? How do we speak in data terms, which means that the, the stakeholders and the people we're trying to bring on that journey are with us. Um, so essentially we looked at how we could you know, put a sort of a mechanism in place which looks at how we measure and track um, LGBT inclusion maturity. And there's a benchmarking tool that we use you know, within the industry that looks across you know, 10 different indicators. And what's been really great about this is that it provides that that sort of framework, if you like, to have the discussion, to focus hearts and minds, uh, and to make uh, roles and responsibilities and accountabilities um, for this um, sort of really clear. So I think two points from me really is around how do we make that visibility really clear, really obvious, consistent, um, as opposed to just marking LGBT diversity dates all year through. Um, and actually, how do we start really putting a framework together to understand organisationally what are the things that we can do and, and really drive and to start making a difference uh, to sort of diversity inclusion um, overall. Great, thank you. And then Suki, what kind of things are your two organisations doing to combat these um, stereotypical perceptions of the LGBTQ plus community? Yeah, I think we have to remember that stereotypes and bias are kind of prevalent in every community, like we have it for every community, race, gender, disability and LGBT plus is such a wide acronym the reason I use LGBT plus is to be more inclusive because even me as a gay man I struggle to know what all the different letters are after the T and I'm trying you have to evolve your knowledge and engagement and education of what these different identities are and you find sometimes like the T wants to separate from the LGB because they see it as a separate issue so if you then come if you think about um the the business world like the we don't really know how LGBT, for instance, leadership teams and boards are because we haven't collected the data. So when, for instance, we um, uh, Matt talks about it being very heterosexual, I would always say supposedly heterosexual because actually there are definitely some chairman and CEOs that I would definitely like be doubting whether they are fully heterosexual. But anyway, that's for another webinar. Um, but the, the stereotypes are really important. So the first thing that we did was with the role model list that we published um, eight years ago. Um, globally with the Financial Times. And the, that was one of the main reasons we wanted to publish them is because we wanted to challenge stereotypes about where people expect our community to be. It's a given that we dominate the entertainment world, the arts, etc. but we are more than Ellen DeGeneres and um, Graham Norton, who I love by the way, they're fabulous, they're amazing, but we're more than entertainers. Like the number one um, executive in the very first li list we did in the FT, was the UK CEO for um, HSBC, Antonio Samoas. He'll always have a very special place in my heart. In fact, actually, behind me on that screen, can you see that? That there? That's the very first list. That's the, that was in the report. That's the top 50 behind me. And you can see like Antonio's there. <laughs> Because I did, I did a VC with him recently. So he's now his career has climbed even further from being in the list because he, he wasn't really very well known. Now you can imagine we reached millions when it came out in the FT, and obviously it grew each year with them. We now publish it with Yahoo Finance, who are our global media partner, because they're one of the world's largest aggregation websites. So we reach millions, and it's great for our community because it's sharing stories of people that are in business doing great things for their community, both inside and outside the workplace and encouraging others to step up and do the same. Because remember with LGBT+, it's invisible. You can't see it. Well, you might, you might assume it because of the stereotypes that exist of our community, but you have to actually self-declare that you're LGBT+. So the whole, because we're not in the business of outing people, we have to make sure we've got the permission of the individuals to publish them in something so high profile. Um, so that f was the first thing around challenging those stereotypes and inspiring the next generation, because there just wasn't that critical mass of leaders that were out at the top. And I like to think as a direct result of the work we did with the role models, which we call outstanding, like we've had more and more LGBT leaders come out globally because they've realized they're not alone. There is this great community at a very senior level where we actually are bringing them together to have um, to share experiences and inspire the next generation and challenge stereotypes. So that's probably the key thing. But then in Involve, we deliver lots of different trainings in different areas. And one of them is around unconscious bias training, which we call conscious inclusion. 
And the training is really important because it's about helping you understand what your biases are, but giving you the skills and tools to mitigate them once you leave the room. So we deliver this to global businesses to lead it. And we always start with the leadership team and the board. Like it has to start with them because if they don't understand their biases themselves and knowing what to do with them, why, why is everyone else going to follow them in the business? Like the people at the top are the culture carriers in the organization. And that's who they're looking to for the kind of behaviors that you should be role modeling that you expect in your workforce. And with everyone working remotely, we have to be thinking even more carefully about inclusion because actually there are people probably living at home in environments that aren't LGBT plus friendly and actually going to work was their place of escape, like not being at home. So we have to be a little bit more thoughtful about how we support our community going forward. Well, thank you both. And it's really interesting to hear what both your organisations are doing on a global scale as well. So it's not just national impact that you're having. Um, I'm going to turn a question towards um, Sorsha now. So there's been a move towards using pronouns more widely. So I, I know we can see that all our panellists here, we've got our pronouns in our um, Zoom names. What impact do you think this has had or having and why do you think organisations or um, universities should be adopting this as well? Yeah, definitely. I think actually, as Suki was speaking there, as something that was going through my mind um, in terms of stereotypes in the workplace and, you know, like homosexuality, as an example, you know, is people are quite used to that idea by now in, the, in broad terms. But I think in terms of gender nonconformity or transgender identity, it's still very much not understood and even within the LGBTQ plus community, you know, there can be a lack of knowledge there and that can have, you know, impact in, you know, the questions that you're asked once you come out in a workplace, um, you know, all those kind of ideas of intrusive questions and kind of, um, and some people aren't brave enough to be like, no, this is actually a valid identity that I hold. And that's where I think people fall through the cracks, you know, and that's why where allyship is so important, for example, you know, the stress that a cis gender person might experience in correcting somebody else's pronouns when they, you know when somebody's been, been misgendered that's marginal compared to the, the stress and the effort that that person the, the person that's being misgendered themselves would have to go through in that situation so i think um including pronouns more often is a great way to normalize not assuming somebody's identity based on what they look like or sound like or what their name is um, so I think that's why it's even important for, you know, cisgender people. I think sometimes people think, oh, my pronouns are what you'd expect. Why would I need to, you know, tell everybody? But it really contributes to that culture of not assuming, like I say, and giving people the space to let people know information about themselves as opposed to having to, you know, feeling like it's forced out of them. Um, so I think it's definitely a shift that is needed um, and that everybody, you know, LGBTQ plus or not, cisgendered or not, um can contribute to um to make you know the workplace more inclusive for everybody oh, thank you i've just seen a question come in um if someone doesn't know what their pronouns that they're comfortable with are if they're still going through like a questioning of their gender identity what kind of advice would you give them or what pronouns would you recommend that people use when they're in that place of questioning yeah, I think that's, you know, an entirely subjective in a lot of ways um, thing. It depends, you know, if you're comfortable enough to experiment with your pronouns in your workplace, which is great, um, then, you know, having that relationship with the people around you to say, I'm experimenting and I'm not sure, because that's one of the great things, you know, you kind of need to hear your pronouns used and you need to hear people refer to you in order to know whether it's right for you or not. So in a workplace, if you are comfortable enough to just say to the people around you, you know, I would like to be used, I would like to use these pronouns right now. This may change in the future. But once again, having people understand that and be um, accepting of that and not think, why would your pronouns need to change? You know, it's kind of even what I was saying before, it's all interlinked. Um, so in terms of advice, if I would say just whatever you're comfortable with, you should be able to be, you know, confident to say to the people around you. Um, what what you would like to, how you would like to be referred to um or if it's in a workplace you know there should be always somebody that you can go to in a workplace who will be able to support you so if you want to go to your boss and say i'm having you know an, an, a journey with my gender identity and i would like to be referred to as this in certain situations you know having someone who will safeguard that for you is really important and really valuable so i would say yeah i think that's that's everything that i would have to advise 
I think that's I think great advice, yeah. Osha. And actually, one thing I'd add is remembering that we're not always going to get it right. Like, mm -hmm. okay to make mistakes because we're not doing it from a place of hate. And that those mistakes can happen within our community, not just LGBT plus and straight people. Mm -hmm. So we just need to have empathy on both sides and remember that actually we will sometimes get it wrong. And actually, particularly using the pronouns they, them, you do really have to consciously think about changing your language. It is not easy. But you, if you are, if you want to be inclusive, you have to consciously think about how you change the way that you speak to someone. So I just, I just think always lead with empathy. I think is really important too. Yeah, that actually really resonates with me actually, um, so because quite often, you know, most people that I meet, certainly in the business context, haven't necessarily thought about gender being non-binary before, and actually for them, it's male or it's female. Um, and the concept of that sort of gender spectrum is just something that most people just haven't been exposed to or had have the conversation about. But I know the, the, the training that, that, you know, that we deliver when we have you know, conversations with you know, businesses and, and clients, actually one of the most attended sessions is LGBT language and terminology. People are absolutely fascinated by you know, different terms and how they're developed and you know, how people um, you know, define themselves and think about themselves, etc. Um, so I think it's I think it's a really interesting conversation at the moment. I think businesses are starting to understand actually, you know, but just by having pronouns, it it normalizes having conversations about gender identity um, and actually making mistakes. And I think the point you made around, you know, having the uh, the space, if you like, to make those mistakes and that be okay, is a really important part of creating an equal culture, you know, an inclusive culture where you can have that conversation around, you know, making a mistake and understanding why the mistake happened. And I think we're starting to see a lot of leaders now leading conversations around this. Um, we actually delivered a session a couple of weeks ago where we're talking to, you know, a C-suite leader and they, they actually made a mistake during the conversation and then corrected themselves. But it was just really brilliant because it normalized making mistakes and then all of a sudden, People are talking on the chat function, asking questions, you know, getting more involved and it then role models the practice of making mistakes, which gives people confidence to have the conversation because then we feel less making a mistake. So I think really great points. Yeah, thank you, all of you. I think it's really interesting and goes back to what Suki was saying about um, as members of the LGBTQ plus community, you have to kind of out yourself. A lot of the time and with pronouns if we're all using pronouns we're not just limiting it to those who are non-binary or transgender having to out themselves that it's we're not making those assumptions so i've got another question for um both matt and suki i don't know if maybe we can start with suki this time um what advice would you give to uh, university students or um, employees who are dealing with hostility or homophobia from colleagues? Yeah, I think I, I answered, I gave some advice on the, I'm trying to be interactive, you know, with the, down with the kids. Um, the, yeah, for me, first of all, that's like effectively a microaggression. So we shouldn't be dealing with microaggressions and they need to be dealt with. And again, I, I come from, let's lead with empathy let's seek to understand, like if they're making comments around like not being, not approving of gay marriage in front of you, knowing that you're LGBT plus, that is a microaggression. So it's about addressing it. So for me, it's about leading with, trying to have that conversation with them directly, maybe one-to-one -one, taking them to one side, because they may be doing it unconsciously without realizing they're doing it. So it might not be, be done in a bullying or a harassment kind of way. And if you're not brave to do it on your own, maybe speak to a friend and go with, take them with you to talk to that person and take them to one side. If that person doesn't then react in a, an inclusive, empathetic way, then you, you probably want to just see how the relationship falls. And if you, if you suffer from more microaggressions or comments or, or harassment, and then you probably then want to take it down the formal channels of reporting it, because it, any kind of harassment shouldn't be tolerated or accepted. Like I think we've got past the, the point of tolerance and we want to be accepted, accepted within all walks of life. So I think um, lead with empathy, try and address it directly, try and address it in a constructive way um, rather than um, aggressive. And if that doesn't work, I think go down the formal channels because you shouldn't have to tolerate those kind of behaviours. Yeah, great. Matt, I'm did you- I'm quite direct about things like that, but I'm probably <laughs> quite confident 
and quite willing to like fight it out with someone in a nice way. For, but then not everyone is is like me. So you have to remember we have different personality styles to deal with and we need solutions that work for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Matt, I don't know if you had anything oh, to- I'll my soup while we talk because I'm bloody starving. That was my husband. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, I think just, yeah, I, I completely agree with you know the points that sort of Suki made there. And, you know, a bit like Suki, I really enjoy, um, you know, getting into a debate around why someone thinks a certain way or you know, holds a certain belief. And I think, you know, my sort of view is that, my personal view is you have to, you have to kind of accept what, other people sometimes think and feel, um, regardless of whether we like that or not. Um, but I think it's around, you know, learning to, to 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 call out, isn't it? When you do hear something, we often call, we often say call in in the inclusion world. You know, actually to lead with empathy, to quote sort of Suki there. Um, you know, and try and understand why the person has either said something deliberately, which is more extreme, of course, or actually if it is more of a microaggression and it's sort of been said, but people haven't really understood the, the impact of language choices of what they have said then there's, there's a way in which we need to try and unpick that you know I, I always leave with the question help me understand really great you know great sort of coaching questions to get someone to think about why they have said something um you know help me understand when you said x um did you actually you know realize the impact that that had on y or me um and i just want to try and you know talk that talk that through with you um, so I think absolutely, I think there's an element of calling in, having that discussion, but again, not everyone certainly hasn't had the confidence when I was at university to take on these discussions. Uh, now I do it all day long, but, you know, I, I think if you are lacking the confidence to speak up for yourself, and that's completely normal, by the way, um, I think my big advice is make sure that you've got a friend or a sponsor or a mentor or someone that you can get things off your chest with and that can help you with that, because we know when we talk about, you know, as well be kind of disproportionate impact of mental, you know, poor mental health within our community is that we often don't talk things out and deal with it and it goes in the box and it's just something else that, you know, death by a thousand cuts that chips away at us over time. So I think there's a, a real clear, I think the action that you would take would be very different if it was a deliberate hate crime or comment. I think the way you would deal, would deal with that would be very different to how you deal with perhaps an unintentional um, you know, microaggression or, or something that, that people don't realise the significance of. I think if it's the first, you absolutely, you know, you've got to escalate it, you know, you've got to report it, um, you've got to take that on or get somebody else to take it on uh, your behalf. Um, alternatively, if it's a more of a microaggression, then I think leading with empathy and really trying to, you know, lift the bonnet up on, on why that happened and why that person said what they did and making sure they really understand the impact uh, of what they said. So I think it, I think it depends on the, on the context. Absolutely. And then um, a question for Sorsha. So speaking of kind of support groups or um, allies and support for LGBTQ plus community members, uh, could you talk us through maybe any groups that the university has or resources that LGBTQ plus community members could access? Yeah. Um... So obviously we've got the LGBTQ plus association um, and we've, you know, completely moved online most this year. We're using a discord server, which I think actually has really fostered a lot more community. You know, you don't necessarily see somebody's face when you're chatting to them online. So there's not that kind of, you know, the people don't group together. Everyone's very, you know, open and it's a really great space um, to learn at events that we do or to have fun at social events um so yeah the association i would really recommend if you're looking for some you know companionship company lgbtq plus like-mindedness um and in terms of the work that i do i mean i as an officer i try to listen to students and be a person that students can approach um and you know i, I have been doing some kind of research um into the L uh, mental health experience of lgbtq plus students um over the last few weeks and hopefully that will culminate in you know, the creation of some more robust um, resources for, you know, particularly mental health um, and kind of those sort of areas. But yeah, the association I would go for to first. Also, there are lots of other associations, you know, for intersectional identities, um, the Black and Ethnic Minority Association, you know, has an LGBTQ plus officer. So I think um, if you're interested in kind of university associations and groups and stuff, you can always reach out and ask. And if there isn't an LGBTQ plus specific angle, like I'm sure there will be one, you know, created. Um, I think student groups at UOB are very good at responding to students' needs um, and, you know, creating spaces for, for when and when they need them. So, yeah. 
I think that's amazing, actually, the, the work that you're doing there. And, and I'm sure Sir would probably take your comments as well. But I'd love to see what some of the research and the data points are telling us. And I know, um, you know, from speaking to businesses, and again, so we'll apply to Suki, you know, organisations are really interested, actually, on what emergent talent, entry-level talent, young people are really experiencing. So we often hear this concept of reverse mentoring, for example, within business, where it's all around how do we educate and bring to life some of the issues and lived experiences that people in underrepresented groups, you know, face. But um, I definitely welcome an opportunity to, to chat with you about what that research is saying and potentially uh, look at how we can take some of that learning, really important learning, um, to our industry. Yeah, most definitely. I think that sounds like a great, yeah. Oh, I actually wanted to ask a question, if I'm allowed. So obviously, I, I graduated in 2002, um, which is a long time ago. And yeah. what, what's the, what is it, what is the feeling in, because obviously there were stats when, obviously when I, when I came, I didn't come out, I was not at university. I mean, someone said I was never in, quite frankly, <laughs> with the way that I am, but um, I wasn't, I was in the closet, I would say, and I didn't come out probably until I was about probably 2005 or 2004 or five. Um, and it, it was a very different world even then, in 2004, to what it is now. So what is it like at the moment at university? Because there was a stat um, when we launched uh, Outstanding um, eight years ago that 62% of graduates went back into the closet when they started their first job. So they were out at university, but then going in when they got their first graduate role. What's, what's the, I don't know, that's gone down to about 45% now from, from Stonewall that did some research the year before last. So what, are people more out and open at university? Because you talk about these networks, for instance, that are being set up. What is the mood in the University of Birmingham specifically? Yeah, um, I mean, obviously I'm speaking from a bubble of being very involved in the association. Yeah. Um, so I, do, I can't speak necessarily for the wider LGBTQ plus population. But I think we have a variety of people um, on varying stages of, you know, being in or out of the closet. And there's lots of things in measure to safeguard, you know, like that they can be involved and, you know, take part in LGBTQ plus events um, without, you know, being forced to come out. I think especially, as you mentioned earlier, the the shift onto online and a COVID world has been very, has presented a lot of differences for people's home lives and how much they can and cannot, you know, be involved in different things. Um, but I think in general, there are, there are, for example, there's an LGBT mentoring scheme that um, has been run by um, Sean from Get Out, Stay Out. He's been working in higher education. I don't know if you've ever <laughs> come across him um, for 15 years now. Um, so he very much, you know, is, he also runs ally workshops and there is a bit, there, I think there is more of a focus that I can see anyway on LGBTQ plus employability and students are, you know, actually ask, actively asking and reaching out, like, how can I, ensure that I can be safe and out and happy in the workplace. Yeah. Um, so I think that there are things in place. There is definitely a movement towards reducing the the need for people who might feel that, you know, they won't be able to be out in the same capacity they could be yeah. in their university life in the workplace. Because I, I understand there was a re research last year that showed that with Gen Z, for instance, um, there's a high proportion of them that are not identifying as um, totally straight. So actually there's a higher proportion that are identifying more as LGBT plus, which is really interesting. So it, I think we're seeing as generations go on that there is more acceptance and visibility, I suppose, and openness within our community where labels may not even be needed in 20 years time. Mm -hmm. So who knows? I'm not a futurist, so I'm not, I'm not that clever. <laughs> It'd be very interesting to see though in 20 years time, what the, what, our like stance and what different identities we have. Um, going back yeah, to yeah, Matt, that raise a point. Is that all right? Yeah. Yeah. There's something that's said actually about you know him not being out at university, and I had a bit of a similar experience because, I mean, I was part of the sort of a, a section twenty eight um, sort of uh, age group, if you like. So I left school in two thousand and three, uh, obviously the same year that section twenty eight was repealed. So basically, in school and education. There was no visibility, no conversations. There was no outstanding top 100 list. There was just nothing out there. In my little town, you know, from where I'm from up north, where there was visibility of gay people. In fact, the only sort of exposure I really had to the LGBT and gay was when a, a guy called Bruno on Coronation Street came out, if you remember, um, long, long time ago. Um, and actually, when I got to university, LGBT, you know, my identity, I just didn't feel that 
you know, it was okay to be open about it. Um, and it took me a long time to really, you know, to really get comfortable. And I, I popped a note actually in, in the sort of question before um, that was really to say that actually I, I actually didn't join the LGBT groups because I was scared of being seen. What would people think? Um, but I actually made lots of friends and found amazing acceptance in some of the other university societies. And actually the Guild Musical Theatre Group is basically where I grew up at university um, had a lot of fun there. Um, so I think, you know, piece of sort of advice for me as well is, you know, look at the, you know, what the LGBT community groups have got to offer. Um, but, you know, try and make out people from different backgrounds as well outside of um, sort of the community too, because that, that worked really well, um, you know, really well for me. That's great. Thank you, Matt. Um, and then if we I, um, pass on a question from the Q&A. So what kind of resilience strategies do you have you used or would you recommend for LGBTQ plus employees or university members going about trying to be their authentic selves at work or in university? Um, I don't know which one of you would like, like to answer that one. I guess it'd be good to sort of just clarify what you're looking to get out of that question because there's a few different ways. Um, so the question is, what resilient strategies do you have um, to try and stay patient and humble in, okay. in your LGBT identity? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to take a first stab at that. Um, so if you like, but I think it's I think it's making sure you've got a support network around you is is a is a key part. Um, and perhaps if I can talk from the work, you know, in in the, in the context of the workplace. Um, I actually had a conversation with someone yesterday um, who's like a, a chief compliance officer and they've recently just found out that someone on my team um, who's worked with them for four years uh, is gay. They never, you know, never had that conversation before, never really talked about what's going on in your personal world. Um, obviously that's prevented, you know, the, the person in the team potentially from being as open and, and you know, bringing their authentic self potentially to, to work. So I think you know, it really sort of shines a light on the fact that we, you know, we, we, we do need to be talking about these things. And I think one of the ways in which we can, you know, really sort of provide us that support mechanism around us, what we feel confident, this is all about confidence, um, you know, is making sure that, you know, if there are LGBT uh, networks or a diversity event, you know, join it, because this is how uh, these two people that I'm talking about in particular actually got connected about LGBT issues. Um, so I think it's making sure that, you know, you have got, you know, a mentor, you know, support that, you know, that support network around you to, you know, to be there for you and potentially talk, talk through your approach um, if it is coming out in the workplace or if it's, you know, being open about your um, sort of identity. So I think that's one thing that I would really sort of recommend. I'm all about sort of uh, personal and self-development as well. Um, and actually one of the things that I did um, when I was sort of coming out at the right old age of sort of 18 um, was, you know, really making sure that I was you know getting confident in who I was. I used to do a lot of writing in a journal, you know, in terms of mind training. Um, that actually, that process actually really helped me. So I think there's, there's certain things that we can do, both you know that are personal driven, but also if it is in the workplace or it is within a community, I think it's really important that we sort of sneak and sniff out those people around us that are sending those signals of you know I'm supportive, you can talk to me, and having that trusted person or people around you. Um, to fall back on and to be able to talk. Uh, and I think if I'd have that, you know, start my career, you know, because I had probably very little resilience when I came to London when it came to my identity and, you know, being myself at work. I think if I'd known that person were there, regardless of whether I talked to them or not, actually I would have felt a whole lot better. Um, so I think just making sure that you, you can find those sponsors around you. I don't know if Suki, you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I'd probably just add... Uh, with res I think with resilience, a lot of it might come down to like doubt you might have about yourself. So being able to like really believe in your abilities, I think is really, really important. So um, I know Matt mentioned confidence. I think confidence is really important, but confidence is something that you can build yourself. So one thing I say to a lot of candidates, particularly when we're interviewing them, because what we find, we, we rec recruit at board level and um, leadership level for our clients. So when we're interviewing diverse candidates, be it LGBT plus women or racially diverse candidates, they're always very quick at telling us what they're not able to do on the role profile. Let's say it's a CFO or a board director. 
and I'll normally stop the interview and get them to start again because I know that the straight white guy I'm about to interview is going to tell me he can do everything and he probably hasn't even looked at the role profile so I'm, I'm kind of like fake it till you make it because that's what a lot of other people are doing and it's that kind of imposter syndrome where you need to fight that that little ghost or devil that's on your shoulder telling you you're not good enough or that you can't do something so you have to kind of tra change your mindset I think there's something else also about the way that you try and deal with change, I think is really important. So one thing that I've, and people having run a business now for 10 years or two, because involved for the last eight years, um, one thing I've learned is that change is the one constant. And I'm very good at dealing with change. Like I have no issue when things change or you have to shake, move to a different direction, but people are different. And some people are normally like terrified of change that might be happening around them. Some people embrace it. And so we need to have different strategies to try and make sure that we're working with individuals. So for me, whenever you're trying to build resilience is, is almost like over communicate what's happening in the business so that there isn't that uncertainty or doubt because then that should hopefully allow them to be more resilient for what's about to come. So I think things like that are really important. And Matt mentioned about the support network. I think that's really important. Having like your cheerleaders around you that are going to support you and champion you in what you do, be it in personal life or professional life, I think is really, really important because you want people that are going to lift you up. If you've got people around you that aren't giving you the kind of energy and positivity that you need, why do you have them in your life to begin with? I know you can't choose your family, but with friends you can. <laughs> you, can you can like get rid of friends that are kind of bringing you down or making you feel like crap. But so I think it, it's really, it's having almost a little bit more self-respect for yourself. That positive attitude, I think is really important too. Thank you both. I think we've probably got time for one or two more questions. Um, so I've got a question here. What can diversity officers and companies do to help LGBTQ plus employees? So I'm not sure if you have diversity officers within your companies, if part of you. I mean, I, I don't, I, I don't have a, a, we're 40 people globally and obviously diversity and inclusion is everything that we do. So we don't have a DNI person, but the key thing about, D, we obviously work with a lot of global businesses that have chief diversity officers and we actually recruit chief diversity officers. So we just recently um, appointed the chief diversity officer for Spotify in New York, which is one of the most influential CDO seats in the world. We've also done it for LVMH, for Chanel, so we've got really great experience of recruiting um, for that particular seat. And the one thing that I would say about that role is, first of all, it's not just the CDO's responsibility to do diversity and inclusion. They're there to perhaps create the framework, the best practice, the policies, but it's the business that needs to own and drive the diversity and inclusion. Like you can't throw it to HR or the diversity person. So the other thing about is when we're being retained to run a CDO search, is well what's the infrastructure that's set up for the person once they're in the seat because if it's just a one person or one man band or one woman band or one non-binary person in the in the business then actually what support are they given what kind of mandate or support do they have to actually deliver all the diversity and inclusion because there is so much focus and scrutiny on that particular seat right now that actually they need the infrastructure to be able to do what needs to be done but the the kind of key thing there are and the thing about diversity and inclusion is this question is not an easy answer because it's not just one answer. Like you have to have multiple strategies to be able to have an impact when it comes to diversity and inclusion. So for instance, starting with data is a good place to start with. Like what is the demographics you're dealing with within your own organization at the moment? What's your ethnicity pay gap, your gender pay gap, any kind of data points you can have to inform what you want to do. Are you doing focus groups to get the lived experience from your diverse communities further down the career ladder? Are you understanding what their experiences are day to day? Because you have people that might be suffering from harassment or discrimination or feeling that they can't progress. Then what kind of tools can you also do? So creating, depending on the size of your business, if you're a global multinational, you should have employee resource groups. You should have groups specifically for gender, race, ethnicity, um, LGBT plus, disability, family um, networks, it could be whatever you think the, the organization needs, but then they need to be set up for success as well. Are they being run effectively? Because they should be run like a business. Do they have a plan? Do they have objectives? Have they got a strategy? How are they measuring performance? Do they have an executive sponsor that sits in the C-suite of the organization that's helping them, to helping them to drive what they need to do and amplifying their voice? And then you've got like ideas around the trainings that you could implement, measuring the effectiveness of them. 
can you, if the leaders aren't really listening to what needs to happen with diversity and inclusion, what about setting them targets that where diversity and inclusion targets are linked to their reward? So if they're not going to listen because it's the right thing to do, then they definitely will listen if they feel they're not going to get their full bonus at the end of the financial year. So what are the, the, there are kind of the carrot and stick approach you can have, which I think you can do in tandem, depending on who you're dealing with. But that, I mean, there, there is a whole list of other things that you could be doing. It's not just one, one thing, but the key thing is it's not just the diversity officer's responsibility. The CDO needs to help create the strategy, but the business needs to drive it. That was quite a long answer. I'm really sorry. <laughs> To it's really good though. Really, really deep. <laughs> I agree with a lot of those points and I think I'm sure you'll agree Sophie, one of the biggest hurdles and common barriers when we talk to businesses about diversity and inclusion is it's that person's responsibility over there who does d &I, who's in HR um, and it's kind of like you know and hence your question what can the diversity and inclusion person do to help LGBT people I think is, is the question that you pose. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, a diversity, depending on the seniority, but, you know, diversity and inclusion advisor, chief diversity officer, you know, executive leader in that function, their job is to set up the framework, the governance, you know, the strategy, the objective, the things that, that Suki talked about. But their real job is, is to enable and empower the business and its leaders to deliver on your LGBT inclusion strategy in, in tandem with the network. So I think, you know, the DNI is kind of the, you know, the, almost sort of the, the governance and almost the police, if you like, when it comes to making sure the right mechanisms are in place for a diversity inclusion strategy to thrive. But I think equally that their real role in terms of how they can help, um, you know, LGBT employees is making sure that the, the network and the sponsorship around the LGBT agenda is really sponsored. And I don't, I don't mean financially, but I mean, what does it really mean to be an executive sponsor? And actually, what, what are the roles and accountabilities? And over a time period, what are the strategic objectives and the outcomes of that person's role and how is that being reported? So with some of our, our members, we're seeing some fantastic sponsorship now, not just of being an executive ally, but actually taking on really quite serious conversations at senior level around things like, um, you know, parity and employment policies. You know, how do we make sure that the benefits that we're providing to non-LGBT people are also available to LGBT people. We're seeing executive sponsors take on the conversation around um, healthcare benefits for trans and non-binary people. Um, you know, and, and actually going out of your way to influence and get something done. So I think going back to the question around the DNI, that role, it's there as a an enabler, but it's not there as the answer. But there to unlock engagement from the business and to make sure that all the LGBT efforts for the benefit of our LGBT talent. Um, are sufficiently in place, being measured, being reported on, um, and that action is sort of being taken. Yeah, I think it's interesting what you both said about it's not just up to the LGBTQ plus community to dismantle these um, perceptions or, or um, discrimination. It's up to allies as well or people in positions of power to, to help um, further the, their support. Yeah. I just got I think news actually on my phone, which is quite topical. So it's from Pink News and it says Birmingham Pride confirms new 2021 dates as the UK's Pride season spots triumphant return. Now that's all, that's possible, <laughs> isn't it? So we all have that that to look forward to. Um, I think we've just about run out of time. I've seen one question that maybe we can end on. Um, do you feel optimistic that one day it will be a non-issue if you're LGBT or not? I'm so glad you asked that question because I was going to I was going to bring it up if you did not <laughs> um, I am um, um, I hope so, but I don't think we're anywhere near that. And also remember, it's also based on geography. So I am um, I I'm on the board of um, uh, a nonprofit called Outright Action International, which is based in New York. And um, they're they're a, they're an NGO. They drive um, LGBT human rights internationally. So they did a big piece of research, for instance, about um, uh, the, the chemical castration they try and put LGBT people plus through, which, which um, was a big piece last year. And um, when you see some of the stats in terms of how awful it is for some of our communities in, say, Asia or the Middle East or in Africa, that's when you realise actually we're so lucky here in the UK or even in the US 
where we just have freedoms that aren't afforded to our brothers and sisters in other regions and how far behind they are. It's almost like they're, they're trying to catch up and just how they also need our support to get there. So we have to think of it from a global perspective, not just in our little bubble that we might have here where we're all safe and feel safe, but even in somewhere like the US where it likes to think it's a progressive country. It was only in June last year when the Supreme Court over there ruled that you can't fire someone for being LGBT plus. Prior to that, there were about 18 states where you could be fired for being LGBT in 2020. So there's still a lot. And if you think about the way the policy or legal framework, framework might be the start, it normally takes society a few years after to follow the policies that are being implemented by the administration or by the government. So there's always that time lag we have to think about. So for me, I just kind of think, yes, it might be good where we are right now, but let's spare a thought for our, our brothers and sisters in areas where it's a lot more challenging. Well, thank you. Thank you, Suki. I think we've just about run out of time. So I'd like to thank all of our panelists today for, for coming along and sharing their experiences and um, recommendations and advice to, for all our attendees. I'm gonna pass back to Rose, but thank you again um, from all of us for giving us your time. Thank you as well. I, I realised that I kind of forced myself onto the screen then to kind of be like, well, I think it's done now. Um, yeah, thank you again from, from the business school to, to Lori, uh, Sosha, Suki and Matt for your thoughtful, thoughtful contributions. You can obviously see that I've paid attention so much and I can't speak now. Um, to our audience as well, thank you for coming to today's web webinar. Um, the next session we'll be running in this series will be celebrating entrep entrepreneurial women within the sector. Uh, that will be on the 11th of March to celebrate International Women's Day, which is happening on the 8th. So have a look out for that. Uh, if you want to post on social media about this series, please remember to use the hashtag BBSEDI so we can connect with each other. And once you close the Zoom window, you'll be directed to a really short survey. It's only four questions and it will really help the future, uh, support the future of EDI initiatives in the school and the university. So that's everything from me. Thank you again for all our panelists. Um, See you. Yeah. Keep, keep fighting the good fight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Really awesome. Awesome. Make sure you Thank you very much. Get your degree. Get your degree. <laughs> Good job. Yeah, um, and then you've got a job, it sounds like. Yeah, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> we want you to be the future CEOs of, of, uh, of industry. So yeah, no, it's great to see you. I'm happy to support it and fantastic work. So thank you for having me. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye, bye. Bye, everyone. Take care.